to give you that by PowerPoint. Yeah. So actually, since we are all pretty a bit tired, we'll try to keep it a bit light and possibly funny, and hopefully try to explain something valuable as well. So I am Salvatore. Uh, the I'm guy Armando. over there is Armando. Uh, we are so both before we dive in, I mean, I just wanted to mention, well, obviously, thank you for coming, but uh, for the previewers in the audience, uh, anyone who like um, reviewed no, VMware's code, there are um, gift cards, because Starbucks gift cards for you at the VMware booth to go and uh, you know uh, have a coffee on us. So, well, not today. I mean, you come over maybe. So, is it uh, over? Okay. Yeah. So maybe too late. Sorry. No, you perhaps. Maybe if you grab like. Our, uh, you know, anyway, so as you've understood, VMware is the one that pays the bill. So I am Salvatore, the fat guy, is Armando. He used to be fit, yeah, but right. now probably he's getting old, you know. <laughs> Especially after and a week of binge eating. I'm so not sure what do we that. do in our life? We both are core OpenStack Neutron developers. I'm usually the one that breaks things, that he comes in and he fixes my code. So for this reason, since I'm the one that breaks stuff, I'll... I don't understand anything, I'll start talking and speaking. You don't really listen to me. Then Armando will come in and tell, tell the serious things about how to write, what are the things that you need to consider when writing a Neutron plugin. Today's talk is uh, about writing Neutron plugins. The title, if, you've been, if you think that you get out of this talk and you'll be able to write a Neutron plugin and understand anything about Neutron well, the title of the talk is very, very misleading in that case for you, I'm afraid. But hopefully we'll be able to give you at least the bits that will enable you to understand whether you really need to write a Neutron plugin, that's the first thing that we need to consider, and if you really need to write a Neutron plugin, where you should start from. So we can start move on. In the first part, we'll just try and be a bit of recap of what is a Neutron plugin, what is an extension, what is a service plugin, just to put a little bit of an order on some terminology which, especially for newcomers, may be really, really confusing. Then <coughs> Armando will talk a little bit about the various design choices that you have to face when writing a Neutron plugin, the problems that you might face. This is pretty much based on our experience, both with the uh, open source plugins, like the Open vSwitch plugin which, to, to which we have contributed as well, or to end to the plugin that we maintain, which is uh, uh, the Nasir MVP plugin. Uh, and then there will be the last part, which will, if there is time left, we will look at some, some code for an example educational plugin. Okay, let's move on. The world of Neutron plugins. So this is probably a concept which most of you are already familiar with. A Neutron plugin is basically just Let's say in its simplest form, it's a, a collection of Python modules that implement a standard interface. They receive API, they receive a comma op and operations directly from the API layers. And then they can interface with uh, either with agents, like the layer two agent, the layer three agent, the DHCP agent, or they can control third party controllers, as it is, for instance, in our source code base with uh, the Ryu plugin, or in other cases, they uh, can be a little bit more complex, like they can have a driver, and then that driver is specific for driving a particular class of devices, like it happened, for instance, with the ML2 plugin, where you can have a driver for a, a specific network type, or you can have a driver which uh, for a specific network device. Uh, a plugin is about uh, implementing cooperation. So if a plugin receives a, a create a network operation, its, op its responsibility is to ensure that the, all the operations required for creating that network are performed, but other things like authentication, authorization, uh, validation of request, it's uh, things which are already performed in the API layer. So if you are doing again authorization in the plugin, you're probably not doing something extremely uh, exactly correct because it might be that your plugin will end up doing something that the operator, the user, is not expecting. So uh, uh, sometime you mm, hear talking about service plugins, especially when it comes to advanced service. So we have, for example, load balancing or firewall VPN. What's the difference between a core and a service plugin? 
the core plugin has a minimum requirement of implementing what's defined as a core Neutron API, and this is basically layer two networking and IPAM. A service plugin instead provides additional network services. Currently, if you look at the code base, there are um, a set of service plugins which are already defined. The simplest service possible service plugin is uh, the layer three plugin. Now with Havana as uh, ML2 is a kind of become the new, uh, let's say default plugin, we have a split layer two and layer three services. So you are able to run uh, ML2, which does only the layer two API, and then a service plugin, which does implements the layer three API. Uh, so the difference here is explained probably in the diagrams that you see below. Uh, we have an example on the left where we have a single monolithic plugin. So it is a core plugin which implements not just the core API, but also the layer three and the firewall API and all the remaining APIs. And this is the case of uh, monolithic plugins, as I was saying, like for instance, the MVP plugin. Uh, in this middle diagram, you have a core plugin which implements the core API plus some extension, in this case, the layer three extension, plus another plugin, which is a service plugin, which just implements the firewall, uh, the firewall API. This is the case of, for instance, running uh, the Open vSwitch plugin with the firewall service plugin in Havana. The rightmost case instead is a more, the more modular possible, where you have three distinct plugins, each plugin for a different extension. And this will be, for instance, the case where with Havana, you run ML2, the layer three reference plugin that we currently have, and the firewall reference plugin for the firewall API. So this is about plugins and core plugins and service plugins, but it gets even more complex because we want really to make things more complex for you so that you, you know, get a big headache when approaching Neutron. Some plugins have drivers. What's the difference between a plugin and a driver? The plugin is the interface with the API layer. The driver is uh, an actuator is what performs the operation on a specific backend. We have uh, several examples of plugins with drivers. The ML2 is probably the best example where you have drivers for OpenV switch and uh, Linux bridge, but also driver for Hyper-V, TLF, Arista networks. So, uh, and basically this driver mechanism has allowed us to take what was previously the OpenV switch plugin, the Linux bridge plugin, and bring them together in the ML2 plugin. Because basically we had two plugins that were performing exactly the same operation, exactly in the same way, with the only exception at the end of the day, a command was uh, performed uh, calling OVS VCH SCTL, for instance, for the Open Switch plugin, and calling BRCTL for the Linux bridge plugin. Since there was just a difference in the actuation of the command, you can bring them together have just two distinct drivers and use exactly the same plugin. Uh, why we should do, why it's better a driver than a plugin? Because a driver, of course, doesn't have all the boilerplate code that you need to replugin. So the boilerplate code stays in the plugin and you just have to implement a smaller subset of the code. So moving forward, my mo may, how to make the right decision? Uh, for instance, either implementing a driver or a plugin, implementing uh, a service plugin, or in, uh, implementing a whole new plugin. It's uh, all about trade-offs. So sometimes for, uh, it, it might be difficult to interact with uh, all the different service plugins, uh, the drivers, and so you might decide to go for a new monolithic plugin. In other cases, you might be interested in the flexibility of interoperating with a lot of different systems, and that will be the case where, for instance, you decide to develop a driver, a new service plugin, or an extension that uh, plugin implementers can add to their own plugin. So those are the choices that we have to consider, that we have at the end of the day. For instance, if you have some kind of device, like you are a vendor, you have a switch, uh, you have a firewall, you have a load balancer, and you want to integrate your device into Neutron, do not think about having a new plugin. That will be probably an overkill for you. Uh, in that case, you should think about having a driver. If the device you want to integrate is a switch, think about an ML2 driver. If you have a load balancer, think about a load balancing driver. 
if you have, uh, I don't know, uh, a coffee machine thing, yeah, you need to develop a plugin for a coffee machine. Yeah. Yeah, we are thinking about having Neutron doing coffee in ice house, especially when it's late at night, you know. And instead, if you have a new feature that applies to existing API resources, you have mainly, mostly two choices. Uh, an, an example is a feature which was introduced in uh, Havana, which is the bandwidth metering feature. So you can either have an extension and then add the support for this extension in several plugins, or have a new service plugin. Uh, in the case of the metering extension, since it was like a standalone thing, orthogonal feature, the choice was having a new service plugin. If you consider instead another extension, like uh, uh, the extension for providing the logical routers without NAT, so, so without the feature of, uh, with the ability of enabling and disabling source NATing, that's kind of a something which applies to plugins which are already existing. And so in that case, instead of having a service plugin, you will prefer to have an API extension and uh, relevant plugin support. Finally, when it's the case where you need to implement a new plugin, there's a very, probably a very limited subset of cases. Either if you have a new integrated solution with a vertical stack, like you know, uh, an SDN controller, or let's not call it SDN controller, a controller that does layer two to layer seven features, or if you, for instance, uh, decide that you want to implement uh, let's say the same features like uh, layer two, layer three networking, perhaps also with open source components, but you want to go for a new paradigm. Because for instance, you think that uh, the current paradigm which is used by the open DML2 plugin is wrong and you think you can do something really better, then in that case, if we want to use a different paradigm, you will have to implement, uh, the best choice for you is to implement a new plugin. So I think this concludes the available choices. Let's say that we are now in a stage where we decided that everything that already exists is not good for us and we want to implement a new plugin. So since, you know, I break code, I break stuff, I can't do anything right, Armando is going to talk to well, us I, about I, I just our give plugin should be implemented. I'll just give like, uh, take a pause. And uh, as well, I mean, I was wondering whether you guys have any questions so far. Because um, everything is uh, like crystal clear and we can move on. Yeah, uh, we have uh, one, two, three, uh, 156 Yeah, let's questions. try to keep it interactive because at this time of the day, I mean, it can get boring. Yeah, we should give a gift to people asking questions. What, what can you say about <clears throat> if you want to reuse the plugin, but uh, you need a driver? So is it a type driver or when to write a type driver versus a, when can you get away with just doing a mechanism driver? Yeah, type driver versus mechanism driver is a question that you probably it's specific to ML2. So basically, if you look at the existing uh, type drivers, type drivers are for transport logic, for different transport mechanisms. So you have the fake, uh, sorry, you have a VLAN type driver, GRE type driver, VXLAN type driver. So that's for implementing strategy, strategies for, uh, uh, for doing the transport network. So do I have to allocate GRE tunnels? Do I have to allocate uh, to put a VLAN, uh, sorry, uh, a VLAN tag on the packet, or do I have to do VXLAN as a transport layer? Instead, the mechanism driver is, uh, now I have decided to use GRE as a type driver. How can I implement the GRE tunnel using this particular mechanism, which could be OpenV switch, Linux bridge, the, part the Arista switch, or the XYZ the network device, or the what ABC intelligent super switch layer two to layer 99. So that's the difference between a type and mechanism driver. Mechanism is about the device, type is about the transport. Uh, I wanted to have a, a flowchart, which is a, a very good point. The thing is, if uh, I had that flowchart on these slides, uh, we would end up uh, discussing just the flowchart uh, in this session. So what, do we, what, I'm, what I'm starting to do with uh, what I've been presenting in this session is collecting all this stuff, uh, perhaps either on the OpenStack Wiki or some blogs, which could be a reference for uh, uh, 
developers which are approaching Neutron. But yes, that's definitely a great idea. Make sure that I understood uh, what you said. So uh, given the, the choices that you laid out, I mean, it seems that writing a new monolithic plugin that's not, a, you know, doesn't follow the ML2 model is still okay going forward in Icehouse and definitely, beyond. Definitely, definitely. It, it's still okay. If you, uh, if you have, let's say, your, if you are, want to integrate Neutron with something which is so peculiar that it's very hard for you to integrate into the ML2 framework, or if you think that for some reason uh, your plugin will be a lot less efficient if implemented as an ML2 driver, and you think that the best route for you will be having a new monolithic plugin, well, definitely go for it. And I would suggest that probably in that case I would advise having both an ML2 driver for flexibility and a monolithic plugin, which is possible. Of course, you'll need to do more work, even more work, but that's probably even a better strategy because if you have a user which wants to be flexible and for instance use your particular solution just for layer two and somebody else's solution for layer three, you'll have the layer two driver. But if somebody wants to go vertical with your solution, they could use your, your plugin. So one question over there. Okay, the deprecation of OBS and Linux bridge, it's something which is uh, probably, no, you should not really be worried about. Why is that? Is that because actually the ML2 plugin is not introducing a new v a paradigm which was not already implemented with OpenVSwitch and Linux bridge. I, when uh, you will migrate, migrate from Havana to ISS to your deployment, you will automatically switch from OpenVSwitch or Linux bridge to ML2. There will be no data plane outage, and there will be also an automatic database migration to make sure. Yeah, I, I know people are a little bit laughing because then there will be problems, okay? We know there will be problems. But let's say that at least in theory, they should, on it paper, should there should not be problems. Yes, the agents, for instance, are exactly the same. Yes, uh, the, the agents are still the same. Uh, we can talk about agents more and, about and the session because this, files are, this is a little bit of topic, so I will go ahead with the next session. So next topic. So okay. is there any more question? No, I think we, Amanda, right. you can. It's all so, for you. okay. So once we made like uh, the decision on what kind of architectural choice uh, we want to go for, obviously let's let's dive into like the nuts and bolts on how we can like plan and develop for a new Neutron plugin. So. One thing to, to keep in mind is that obviously, you know, Neutron's uh, first consumer is OpenStack and especially Nova. And uh, so when, when thinking about uh, developing a new plugin, we gotta make sure that if we want Nova to uh, use Neutron um, correctly, uh, we need at least to implement the L3 and, and security group extensions. Uh, so that again, uh, things like security groups and you know, floating IPs uh, can be you know can be dealt with correctly. Um, also, another another thing to to take into account while um, dealing with again the development of a new plugin is um, what what to do with uh, with the the agents. So the DHCP agent and and the L3 agent and the metadata proxy agent. Do do we want to like reuse those or uh, do we want to rely like on third parties services that are going to um, that are going to be used to, to again to provide services like DHCP and and, and uh, you know routing and so on. Um, there are plugins that, uh, like for example the, the the MVP one that uh, do not use the DHCP one but use the L3. Uh, there are others that use none of them. Um, and in Icehouse, for example, the the MVP plugin um, there is work in progress that would uh, basically allow us to. Um, make no, no longer use of the HCP agent. So again, this is something that, that needs to be taken into account. I mean, here there is a flowchart, but obviously it's not the one that you had in mind. Uh, it's more like uh, more of a comic and then something to laugh on more than anything else. But no, actually that's very serious. That's what pretty much happens every day in open stuff. <laughs> yeah, I guess. So, <laughs> so um, point of this line being is um, there are a number of um, considerations to be made while dealing with uh, the 
the actual like coding of, 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 of the plugin. I mean, the way uh, the code is structured uh, today, uh, there is an awful lot of use of um, uh, class, you know, class mixings and um, things like you know, the, the API model and the, the DB model are leveraged using der derivation, so inheritance. Um, those are like obviously are you know issues that impact the way you know you develop the you know the the, the, the actual code, but uh, other considerations r relate to how you know what what is the uh, basically the uh, the relationship between the Newton server and and the effectively uh, the effective like plugin backend. So say for example that that you rely on a controller, uh, things to, to to be taken into account is how how you make the relationship work uh, work. So um, where is where are, you know? Do you keep the, the, the two data stores in sync? Do you make sure that the resources uh, statuses are are kept in sync by using a pull versus a push approach? Um, also, in terms of scalability and availability, I mean the way the server is, is designed. Obviously, you can scale it out. You know, you can run it. Uh, you can run multiple instances of, of the server behind the load balancer. Uh, but you know, what happens to the way you deal with uh, with uh, with the plugin backend? Um, well, oh, so these are some of the issues again that, that relate to to the to the design of the plugin itself. But in in the end, when oh, I'm just over there, it seems like you want to add something. Absolutely not. Okay, you're good. Sure. So okay, when I meant the backend, I meant okay. So, so for example, that uh, your plugin uses. Some you know some controller that is for me like uh, um, what I mean as as backend. Uh, in the end, neutral, the Newton server relies on a database to, to store like, resources like networks, subnets, router, and so on. Um, you have like um, databases that lie like in the in the open base, which is on, on the hypervisor uh, that also represents state, uh, and you also have the uh, the data store that that belongs to the controller. So how you basically make sure that all these resources represent a consistent state is something that you need to you, you, you need to take into account. Also, when you're program when you're programming your your fabric, there may be failures. So how do you deal with things like again transactionality of the operations that are intrinsically distributed? So obviously these things need to be taken into account to make sure that again there is consist eventual consistency at least. Yeah. And uh, when we talk about backend, we are just generally referring to control slash data plane. When you have a kind of a centralized controller, this is somewhat easier, even if not trivial. This becomes really important when you are managing uh, a distributed control plane like a set of switches, for instance. So. I mean, one of the bullets on this slide is uh, mentioning uh, units and functional tests. So one of the you know, biggest problems that uh, we as reviewers face is that when new code is, is, is you know, submitted for review, uh, we have actually you know, no, <laughs> no possibility of, uh, of trying the code out because maybe we don't, you know, we don't have a, a controller at our disposal or we don't have like, the actual uh, uh, infrastructure to, to, uh, to, to try and play with, uh, with the new with the, with the new plugin. So again, unit and functional tests are, or especially unit tests, are a good way for us to really understand how things you know, are, are wired up together and you know, how things uh, really uh, you know, work together. And some, you know, somewhat it guarantees that there is some, you know, some uh, integrity in the code. Um, there are you know, discussions that we're having. We had at the summit and uh, we, we intend to like, work on in the RSI time frame to make sure that every like every plugin submitter uh, not only um, uh, you know provide code that that's you know covered uh, um, you know uh, by units and functional tests, but also we're thinking of having like um, tempest-like tests that are done by some some sort of uh, downstream PI infrastructure. So okay, uh, there is some some boilerplate that needs to be uh, like written in the, in the plugin like uh, subtree, uh, but the way the framework is implemented today, 
um, quite a bit of stuff you know can be leveraged. So things like Salvador has mentioned uh, previously, uh, you know, um, uh, um, authorization and authentication. Um, um, the way you basically can provide, can implement extensions, and the way you um, can uh, add resources or um, new attributes to existing resources. And actually, this is one of the points on the slide. Today, I mean, adding like a new resource to, to, the, to the Neutron uh, um, conceptual model is as easy as writing a JSON dictionary. Uh, and effectively, you can specify for every new resource, you know, what kind of attributes compose that resource, what kind of operations you can do on resource, like create, you know, the, the CRUD, CRUD operations that you can do on the resource, and you can also like specify validators. And those are all things that, are, again, are, are provided in the core framework and then can be leveraged with very little code. Um, also, the way uh, a new pl and, you know a, a new plugin, a third-party plugin, leverages the, the, the data model. So, like the DDB, it's by by inheritance, which mean which means that effectively, like you know, inherit from 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 the, the DB uh, DB uh, code, and you have access to uh, to the DB schema, and you can do operation. Uh, but um, obviously. Um, a new plugin may need to rely on new resources or may need to provide you know, new concepts, which means that you not only need to, again, uh, use the, the core uh, um, DB schema, but you need to introduce new uh, like DB tables and so on, which means that when you think about developing a new plugin, you also need to provide DB migration scripts to introduce this new uh, um, you know, relational seamless to the DB, which basically it's done by using tools like Alembic, uh, which is what we use to deal with the B migration. Any other question? Yeah. Oh, you mean OBS DB, you think? So OBSDB is something that obviously you know uh, it's it's local to to the OpenV switch on the you know on the, on the hypervisor, and you know Neutron has no actual knowledge of the state on 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 that OpenV switch if not for like the kind of uh, ports uh, that that are you know that exist on that node and the state of the port you know on the state of those ports. But we don't have or things like you know performance counters and so on. Uh, there is like uh, a, a basically there is a, a snapshot picture of the important state of that DB in Neutron, but there is Neutron has no way to like to get ac to get access to that to that DB to the local beyond on the OpenV switch, and I don't, you know uh, there is no actual, there is no real intention of like doing something like that for scalability reasons. Okay, so I guess we'll uh, you know for the sake of time let's let's go ahead. Um, so, well, these are more like, uh, you know, um, um, things that need to be taken into account, you know, as, uh, when it comes to, like, the process of uh, contributing a, a new plugin to, to, uh, to, the, new, to, the, to the Neutron, like, um, upstream project. So, obviously, there are certain standards that, that need to be met. We, we will need a fair degree of, of unit test coverage. Uh, it would be important to again provide documentation so that uh, you know, users and other developers can can you know can get can get uh, and have a play with with uh, with, with, the, with the new plugin being submit, submitted. Also, something that easy the pain of uh, again getting you know and, and rolling this stuff out is DevStack. So, uh, for example, uh, some plugins do have support in DevStack. For automating the like the deployment and the the, the, uh, the installation of like third part third part third part lab libraries you know, third part packages and also uh, the, um, they provide like um, is you know installation scripts to again automating the configuration of config files uh, and the, the automation of like launching the the, 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 the the services and so on so that basically once you get like the whole open stack uh, in a box. Uh, in deployment, uh, you can basically verify that things work the way they should. Are there any similarities between the Neutron 
You mean you meant Oslo? So, oh, I mean, okay, Oslo is like, okay, it's an umbrella of, 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 like, of utility libraries, so one of which is, is like Oslo config. Uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily sure whether I see the relationship with Oslo and, and DevStack, I'm, I'm afraid. Right. Uh, okay, so. Uh, basically, Oslo are collection of libraries which are of uh, wide interest for the whole OpenStack project. If there is something which is of interest just for Neutron, that does not make sense to put it in, in Oslo. However, as Armando said, the implementation of a Neutron plugin is based on a derivation approach. So basically, you derive your plugin for a base class which already has plenty of utility methods and functions which you can use for implementing the plugin, especially when it comes with interacting with the database and managing the IP allocation, for instance. That's provided entirely by Neutron. It won't make a lot of sense to put it in Oslo since it's not shared by your OpenStack project. Yeah, I mean, Oslo is more like, you know, cross-functional uh, uh, reuse uh, and cross-project reuse. Um, so one other aspect to take, in, you know, to take into account is that, again, uh, provide um, functional testing via Tempest. Tempest is like the, the API uh, functional uh, test suite for, for OpenStack. And, um, you know, every project like Glance, Nova, uh, Swift, and, and so on, they, uh, again, along with the, with the actual, you know, code that implement features, they provide, you know, test, test cases for doing the old, you know, the end-to-end -end, uh, functional testing. Um, Another aspect to take into account, again, is, as I mentioned before, um, smokestack. So smokestack, it's something that, it's kind of a, you know, a, a, pop, a cop <laughs> that um, uh, patrol the, the OpenStack uh, um, um, ecosystem. Um, so what happens is that every, every commit that's, pu that's pushed for review, uh, it's, it's validated uh, by, by this, like, this um, um, cop uh, called smokestack. So the idea is that, um, for providing end-to-end -end testing, um, we would like to have some sort of CI, downstream CI infrastructure to, again, to, to validate the changes being made. And the reason why we're thinking about C downstream CI infra infrastructure is because the new vendor plugins, I mean, current uh, vendor plugins or new vendor plugins sometimes may need to rely on uh, resources that may be difficult to virtualize, they may be difficult to, like, to scale out. So by basically giving flexibility in saying, okay, you know, do, you know, do something like in your lab, in your environment, to make sure that you can run some sort of functional test suite uh, based on Tempest or based on something else, but at, at the same time, they can provide feedback on the upstream review. It will give us like a sense of uh, confidence that what's being submitted has some, you know, is sound and, 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 and you know, functional. Um, that said, I mean, this, this uh, link kind of, you know, outline uh, the process a little better. And, I mean, we're working in the ice house time frame to make sure that this process, like, gets, uh, you know, gets, gets more mature and, and, and more um, thorough. So I, I guess that we're, you know, kind of run of, I'm running out of time, and I'd like to move on to the next part, which is probably going to be the most interesting one. So I'm going to hand back over to Salvatore. And I mean, if you have any questions, maybe not after this session because it's getting late, but definitely yeah. like tomorrow. So we, we, we have very little time. Uh, luckily, we don't need, you don't need me for the last part of the session. You don't need anybody because it's all, all, everything is on GitHub. So the first part is writing a new plugin. So on GitHub, the link is on the slides. There is the code for this uh, educational plugin. Let's say educational plugin. It's actually a real, very important plugin. It's the HDN plugin. Stop with software-defined networking. We will introduce human-defined networking. So we need to rediscover the human side of information technology. Stop with automation. We don't need, we don't need all this infrastra automation infrastructure. Who needs cloud? Cloud is losing jobs. Due to clouds, we are losing jobs. We need to rediscover the human face of IT. So we have a REST API interface. And these REST, these REST are transformed into emails. 
which are sent to the networking guy in your IT department. If you have more than one networking guy, you can configure all the emails of your networking guy, or if you want, you can just have a mailer. And I am also implementing an extension for supporting phone and fax, if you want. <laughs> and uh, it's an asynchronous, eventually consistent uh, request processing, so you don't need to implement RabbitMQ. Who needs RabbitMQ when you can pick up the phone? And uh, it allows also karma-based request priori prioritization. Basically, the nicer you are to the IT guy, the sooner your request will be processed. This means, for instance, if you have a really important request for a provisioning a new network, buy 12 donuts to the IT guy, <laughs> and you will process your request. How does that work? That's to work. You have the REST interface with a little with a cute resting bear, and then there is the message bus, which is an email, then we'll go to the, our backend, the human-powered plugin engine. So implementing the plugin, we have just the core API at the moment, just for making it simpler. Actually, I've done also the layer three extension. Uh, there is support for networks, ports, and subnets. We can do routers, we can do floating APs. Uh, well, other neutral extensions at the moment are outside scope, because at the end of the day, you really don't need the extension. You just pick up the phone, or you just go into Go meet your IT, tell to your IT guy directly, perhaps you don't even need that extension. So where is the code? Uh, the source code for the HEADN plugin is available on GitHub. Uh, that's the address. Uh, the slides are available on SlideShare. You should be able to access them. And so I tested it with Gmail, but I think it should work with all the SMTP servers. So to cut a long story short, that's where the code is. And basically, all the code that you need is in the, the HDN directory. And uh, the HDN directory basically contains uh, a main file, which is the HDN plugin.py, which is the plugin implementation. Uh, I have added comments throughout the file to explain uh, why there is a particular, uh, a particular thing. We can just look at one detail, for instance, the create a network operation. So, we we'll, on the create network operation, it's important to note that there is, in every operation actually, there is always this context variable. The context variable is really important if you are implementing a plugin because it already contains a lot of information which might be really useful for you. There is the tenant in the context uh, object. You have the tenant ID, which is basically the identifier of the tenant performing the request. You have a flab which is called isAdmin is underscore admin, which you can use to test if the current tenant has admin privileges or not. Because sometimes the same operation is different and perform, perform with the admin privileges or not. To be honest with you, you should use the is admin only real critical cases because usually you should let the API layer perform all the auto authorization operations. And finally, the context, object, uh, the context object has a database session object. So instead of having to worry about connecting to the database, grabbing a session for each operation, you just rely on that context object, which has a ready-to-use database session object. So basically, the code for this plugin, uh, I think we, could, we are kind of out of time, so you can just check out on GitHub, and it actually works, unless the other Neutron plugins, it sends you an email, you know, and uh, you can, what does this plugin? It just calls the base class for performing the database operation, puts the status, uh, you know, puts the, since it's asynchronous, puts the status of the resource you are creating in pending create status, calls this base class to perform the database operation so that the record is entered by the database, notifies the, notifies the plugin and uh, sending an email, notifies the backend, and then it returns. Now, there are already two bugs in this operation. You can spot them, uh, raise, uh, file the bugs on GitHub, and if you want, you can pull requests. I mean, the two bugs, one is regarding REST standards, and so it's about the return code, and the second bug is about data consistency, because we are not properly handling full tolerance, but that's up to you to discover. So you can go on GitHub, uh, file a bug if you find it, if you think you find it, and you can also file a pull request with the patch, and I will be more than happy to accept it. So you're actually so maintaining this plugin? Yeah, I'm actually that's maintaining it. Yeah, that's going to become the default Neutron plugin because yeah, we are all a little bit sick of all this SDN hype and thing. Let's talk about human-defined networking. It's so nice. So 
I think that's all from me, and uh, it's all from us, actually. Uh, we have one we minute to spare. We, are, uh, we still have a few pens. I think we have a few minutes for all your questions. Uh, sorry, what do you mean? Yeah. Uh, in the database, basically you store the status as the resource in the database as a pending create, which is not created. The paradigm is that you have an admin extension that the IT guy will come back and say, oh, the resource has been created and now it's active. In a real world where you have this ugly thing called automation, this will mean that you are running an asynchronous task. When the task completes, it calls a callback that updates the database, which is pretty much what happens with the Open with Switch plugin. So the ML2 plugin, so that at the moment they are still not properly managing the operational status so, setting. So basically here, you know, you, you, there is a state transition between like, you know, a resource not being there to resource being created in an impending state. Now, if the operation would, you know, were to be um, synchronous, then before exiting this method, you will move from pending create to create, and you will return the resource, you know, to, uh, to the user. Uh, in this specific case, as uh, Salvador was saying, you know, the, the, the operation is asynchronous, so there is, you know, you need to make this, the state transition outside the scope of, the, of, you know, of, the, of this method, like, for example, PI and admin, and admin, and admin API call. Uh, well, this, um, I'm pretty sure this will never pass Tempest <laughs> test. Yeah. Because Tempest test actually need that you can uh, be able to provision a virtual machine with these tests. And to be able to provision a virtual machine to these tests, you'll need the network guy to implement it. And unfortunately, Tempest has a ridiculous timeout, like four minutes. Come on, give the guy a break. He can provide all the network in four minutes. Yeah, you can wait until tomorrow, like, or to, <laughs> the day after tomorrow. That would be normal. Tempest should wait two days for a test to complete. Yeah, I mean, you can make this plugin faster. I mean, it also scales horizontally. Just hire more people. Okay, so okay. Uh, they are not yet kicking us out. So just in case you have any more questions, otherwise, thank thanks for listening. Thanks to for thank coming, you for up. coming, guys. And uh, have a good evening.